Hello, I'm Seema and welcome to part 31 of the chapter Hello Alkanes and Hello Arenes. We were doing the reactions of Hello Alkanes and Hello Arenes. And today we are going to do the last video on the reactions of Hello Alkanes and Hello Arenes. We were doing the reactions of Hello Arenes and the third category of reactions are the reactions with metals. But at this time, I would like to just remember what we did in all the reactions, because when you do that time and again, it helps you to keep everything in mind and to memorize all the reactions easier. So in haloalkanes, we did three kinds of reactions. The first was nucleophilic substitution reaction. The second was elimination reaction. And the third was reaction with metals. And in reaction with metals, we said in the presence of dry ether, we react the haloalkane with magnesium and we get Grignard reagents. And um, also we talked of the Wurtz reaction in which you have the haloalkane reacting with sodium in the presence of dry ether to give you a dimer of it. In the case of haloarenes, on the other hand, the first reaction was the same as haloalkanes, that is nucleophilic substitution reaction, but Nucleophilic substitution, towards nucleophilic substitution reaction, haloarenes are not that readily, uh, they will not do it that readily. They would not do it that happily. On the other hand, the second category of reactions are different in both. In the case of haloalkanes, we did elimination reaction. And in the case of haloarenes, we did the electrophilic substitution reaction. So if you do not understand what I'm telling you right now, I would encourage you to watch all the previous videos on the chapter and I'll, uh, you have the uh, playlist to go to. Go to the playlist of Hello Elkins and Hello Arenes and watch all the videos that I did on the reactions. So after electrophilic substitution reaction of Hello Arenes, we now come to the third category of reactions. And this third category is also the same for Hello Elkins and Hello Arenes, which is reaction with metals. But the only difference is that in that case, we talked of the preparation of Grignard reagent. And Grignard reagent, the general formula for Grignard reagents is RMGS, where R is an alkyl group. So haloalkanes lead to the formation of Grignard reagent. But in the case of haloarenes, we do not get the Grignard reagent. Let me write this. You have Rx, that is a haloalkane. And it reacts with magnesium in the presence of dry ether. You need ether because you not want this reaction to be taking place in water. Because water is going to react with all this and the product would be something else. Now what happens, magnesium is a metal. The alkyl group, the carbon which is attached to the halogen, the hal this is a polar compound. The halogen is partially negative and the carbon of the alkyl group is partially positive. So when you have magnesium in the presence of dry ether, the reaction takes place in such a manner that the magnesium or the metal atom comes in the middle. So the product that you get is Grignard reagent, which is RMGX. Now the halogen, which is very electronegative, remains partially positive, uh, partially negative, that is delta negative. And the alkyl group in comparison to magnesium, magnesium is a metal. So magnesium is partially positive and the carbon of the alkyl group in comparison to magnesium is negative. Therefore, this acquires a partial negative charge. So I explained this to you when I was uh, telling you about the reaction of metals in the case of, uh, in the case of uh, haloalkanes, the preparation of Grignard reagent. But for Grignard reagent, the R should be an alkyl group and Aryl halides do not result in the formation of Grignard reagent. But the second part of the reaction, that was the Wurtz reaction, that does take place in the case of um, halo arenes. What is this reaction? Wurtz Fittig reaction. We first come to the Wurtz part. If you take an aryl halide, in the presence of sodium, the aryl and an, a mixture of an alkyl halide and an aryl halide. In the presence of sodium uh, or reacts with sodium in the presence of ether and results in the formation of this uh, product which is an alkyl arene alkyl arene so the sodium and the halogen they form a salt and get separated and the alkyl and the aryl group they join together 
So a mixture of alkyl halides and aryl halides when treated with sodium in dry ether, it gives an alkyl arene. So even in the case of haloalkanes, what did we do? They were both of them were alkyl groups. So what happens? You have alkyl group and you have sodium and you have the halogen. The two alkyl groups, they would combine with each other and result in the formation of a dimer. That is, uh, the product would be RR. That is R attached to R. So you will get an alkane with the number of carbons, which is double of whatever was your alkyl group in the alkyl halide. In this case, you're taking a aryl halide and an alkyl halide. So the same reaction takes place, only now instead of an alkyl group here, you have an aryl group. So you get an aryl halide. Fittig was the scientist we carried, who carried out this reaction, not taking any alkyl halide. Both of them were aryl halides. That is both the molecules or he just took an aryl halide, made it react with sodium in the presence of ether and he found the same reaction takes place. That is the halogen combines with the sodium to result in the formation of the sodium halide and the two aryl groups they join together. Right? And therefore this now combined as a combined way we started calling this as the Wurtz Fittig reaction, naming both the scientists. So this was Wurtz Fittig reaction. And with this, we come to the end of all chemical reactions of haloalkanes and haloarenes. Now, before I wind up this video, I would like to do one in-text question. The in-text question is question 10.7. What does the question read? Which alkyl halide will react more rapidly by SN2 mechanism? And you have to explain. Remember what SN2 mechanism, SN2 is nucleophilic substitution and 2 means that the reaction takes place in such a way that both the reactants, they react together in one step, right? SN2 means both the reactants. So when does this happen? This happens when there is less steric hindrance. If the attacking nucleophile and the basic reagent, they are, uh, the basic reagent is bulky or the nucleophile is bulky. The, uh, for both of them to coexist together becomes difficult. It is uh, as if the example that I gave you when I explained nucleophilic substitution reaction, that there is a bus, a crowded bus that is going where people are standing at the door. If someone has to enter, hop into that bus, he will have to push into it and he will not have enough space. That is steric hinder hindrance, too much of congestion, too much of crowd. So when you have bulky groups, the more the steric hindrance, the lesser the chance of SN2 mechanism. Because how would both the reactants react together when there is too much of crowd? So whenever the, the, there is too much of steric hindrance, the nucleophilic substitution takes place by SN1 mechanism and not by SN2 mechanism. Having understood this, we just have to see the molecules which are given to us and see where would steric hindrance be more. Wherever the steric hindrance is more, SN2 mechanism will not take place. Or we are locating which molecule out of these has lesser steric hindrance and that would help us to tell the one which has lesser steric hindrance would undergo SN2 mechanism. So you have this first molecule here, CH3, CH2, 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 Br. So it is um, bromobutane and this is 2-bromobutane. Now, if you really look at this, here the bromine is attached to the uh, to this carbon the alpha carbon which is a one degree uh, compound so it is a primary uh, bromide and in this bromine is attached to the alpha carbon and the alpha carbon is attached to two other carbons you see here bromine is attached to what the alpha carbon and the alpha carbon is attached to only one other carbon therefore it is a primary halide and here bromine is attached to the alpha carbon and the alpha carbon is attached to two other carbons. Therefore, it is a secondary bromobutane. Steric hindrance is always highest for tertiary, lesser for secondary and the least for primary. So where do you think there is more steric hindrance? There is more steric hindrance for the secondary hydrocarbon. Therefore, or, or hello, uh, what bromobutane. So it is this compound which would undergo SN2 mechanism, right? And then the second example, yes, the second example here is CH3, CH2, CH, CH3 
and Br. Here again you see bromine is attached to the alpha carbon and the alpha carbon is attached to two other carbons. Therefore this is secondary. Right? And look at this compound here. Bromine is attached to the alpha carbon and alpha carbon is attached to one, two, three carbons. Therefore this is a tertiary bromide. Since this is a tertiary bromide and this is a secondary bromide for SN2 mechanism, which one would be favored? The one where steric hindrance is less. And in secondary, the steric hindrance will be less. So this would undergo SN2. This would undergo SN2. And come to the third one now. The third here, again you see the bromine is attached to a carbon, the alpha carbon, which is primary. Here also bromine is attached to alpha carbon, which is primary. Then how do we tell which one would undergo SN2 easier, where there is lesser steric hindrance? So the primary, both of them are primary, so the main factor is not this. The steric hindrance is due to some other reason. So let us see what is that. Both of them, both the compounds have a methyl group attached to them. Do you see this? Here, in this compound, the methyl group is attached to one to third carbon from bromine. It is three steps away from bromine. And in this compound, the alkyl group is attached to the second carbon after that. So it is just two steps away. So if you are in a bus and there are other passengers, if the passengers are standing three steps away from you, you have more space. But if the other passenger is standing two steps closer, or just two steps away from you, where would the steric hindrance be more? Where he's standing two steps away and not three. Three steps would be even free. You, are, you have even more space to yourself. But here, if he's standing two steps away, then the steric hindrance would be more. So here the factor that is important is both of them are primary, but the methyl group is further away here. So there is lesser steric hindrance in this compound and therefore this would undergo SN2 mechanism. If we were on the other hand asked to compare these for SN1 mechanism, in the case of SN1 mechanism, in addition to the steric hindrance, there is another factor which is important and that is the stability of the carbocation. So it has been found that a tertiary carbocation is more stable than a secondary one and the primary carbocation is the least stable. And steric hindrance does not trouble SN1 mechanism as much because in SN1 mechanism at one in one step only one reactant is participating. So in the first step the carbocation is formed and in the second step the nucleophilic substitution takes place. Therefore, if it was, uh, if you were comparing them for SN1 mechanism, you would have found the reverse order. The next in-text question that is 10.8, in that we would be comparing the molecules or the compounds for SN1 reaction. So, but with this, I'll wind up today's video. If you found it helpful, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, recommend it to your friends, and please keep returning for more videos in chemistry. Thank you for watching and bye-bye for now.